How fantastic to see you all in person. This is just divine. Uh, really, really great to, to see you all here on the lands of the Bunwarang, the Bunurong, and the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We have a great evening's discussion tonight. Um, we're going to hear from the author, we're going to hear from these amazing people near and far, and we'll all get to have some discussion and some drinks and head across to Uro Books uh, for some uh, book buying and signing and all of those good things. But to start us off, it is my absolute great pleasure to introduce Fleur Watson, the author of the new curator and executive director of Open House Melbourne. Please make her welcome. Thank you. I'm going to stand if I can. And there's seats at the front, so you should come and join us at the front if you can. Um, but I'm so pleased to welcome you all here tonight. It's been a bit long awaited, this book launch, because the book came out almost nine months ago now. And, um, of course, COVID has delayed us somewhat. So I'm really pleased to be here. Sequel? Um, that's a few years away, if ever. <laughs> if ever. Um, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and sovereign custodians of the land on which we're gathered tonight at Collingwood Yards and uh, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung language group. I extend my respects to their ancestors and all First Peoples and Elders past, present and emerging and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islander people who may be joining us tonight either here or via the live stream. Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded in Australia and as many of us are curators and cultural producers we remain mindful of this in everything we do given our focus on design, the built environment and public programming. So I'm going to just, if I can, just do a few quick thanks um, and then I'm not going to introduce the full panel because Esther is going to do that in her role as moderator. I will introduce Esther. And then if you uh, can bear with me, I'm going to just set the context for the book, um, the kind of ideas behind the book. So firstly, I'd like to thank Matt uh, Ward and Euro Bookstore, Monica and the full team for their support for this event. It's being live streamed and recorded, so it will be available ongoing and we hope this will be the first of many conversations with these incredible collaborators. Shannon Goodwin from Composite for his technical expertise and his creative expertise. The Melbourne Art Book Fair and the NGV led by Megan Patty who's been incredibly supportive for this book as well. Uh, my, fe my fellow panellists and as I said uh, Esther will introduce them in, in more detail. I'd like to acknowledge Stuart Geddes, who is the designer of this book and a long-time collaborator, but also a dear friend. And Stuart uh, really brought this book to life. And my curatorial collaborators, who feature across the many projects in this book. And most importantly, all of you for being here. It's a really busy time with Melbourne Design Week. It's kind of chaos. We're all trying to get to everything, so I really appreciate you being here tonight. And I'm really fortunate to have gathered here tonight six of the 16 curators and creative collaborators who I've had the great fortune to meet, to be inspired by and to work with in the making of this book. Um, and I'm really grateful for you being here tonight in person and on screen. Uh, we'll see Eric in a moment and uh, we're hoping that B will join us as well, Beatrice. So... I'm just going to quickly introduce Esther as moderator and as I said she'll introduce the panel with bios in more detail. So Esther Anatolitas heads Test Pattern, a consultancy focused on creative strategy, practice and precincts. She is Deputy Chair of Contemporary Art Precincts and Honorary Associate Professor at RMIT School of Art. Esther is also the author of the recent publication, Place, Practice and Politics. So when we go for a drink later, you can ask her all about her book. Um, so I, I'm going to just kind of take a, a five, five minutes or so to set the context for this book before we move into the discussion. The new curator at its heart is a deeply collaborative project. It brings together a significant international community of curatorial practice and a body of work and projects produced both here in Australia and globally. 
Much of the research for this book was produced during the completion of a practice-based PhD at RMIT and within my role as curator at Design Hub. And that space was really important to this book. It provided a place to test this research with many other people. I'd like to acknowledge and sincerely thank my curatorial colleagues, particularly Kate Rhodes and Nella Thamelius, uh, who I worked very closely with at Design Hub, and the many creative collaborators over what was an extraordinary productive 10 years. Come in, please, come and sit down the front. <laughs> Welcome. So, the book is somewhat provocatively titled The New Curator. And in that, there is a full acknowledgement that curatorship is certainly not new. I'm not seeking to construct a binary between new and old forms of curating, nor is it my intention to reject the scholarship and the custodianship of established modes of cultural production. Instead, this book seeks to explore, discuss and investigate emerging curatorial, what I call moves, to understand the shifting nature of contemporary curatorial practice today. The book examines the challenges inherent in exhibiting design ideas and research in an expanded spatial practice field. And it explores these emergent curatorial methods and strategies against a diverse range of exhibitions, projects and contexts both within the museum and the institution, and very importantly, outside of that context. Many of these projects and case studies share a deliberate shift away from exhibiting finished works or artefacts towards a more process-driven, or what you might call a performative curatorial practice, which in turn provides a space to test experimental methods for encountering design ideas. And here, the role is of the curator is not that of the custodian or the expert, but with an intent to create a shared space of encounter with audiences, a space that is porous and welcoming, yet simultaneously culturally and socially tuned. In his really great foreword for the book, Director Emeritus of the Design Museum in London, Dayan Sujik suggests that the new curator is working on ways to debate and redefine the subject of design. In this sense, the book is much about design practice as it is about curating. Now, whether you agree with Dayan or not, certainly we can see that design and spatial practice continues to evolve. And arguably, it must change rapidly to increase its relevance, agency, and contribution in addressing significant contemporary challenges, recognising Indigenous sovereignty, responding to the climate crisis, leading the advocacy and in fact the design of safe, affordable and long-term housing, social justice and inclusion and access for all. And much like design practice itself, contemporary curators are also responding to these urgent and shifting conditions. And, they are, are, and they're asking themselves, what is the role and agency of cultural production in this context? What can curators offer in the enormity of these challenges that makes an active contribution to envisaging a better future together? And how do these emer emerging forms of curatorial practice embrace social responsiveness, advocacy and even activism while, and importantly, simultaneously, generating welcoming spaces for exchange that are porous and generous to audiences and encourage them to take an active part of the process. To understand this shifting landscape, the book doesn't define but it maps, identifies and considers six curatorial moves. The designer's exhibit, curator as space maker, the prosthetic, curator as interloper, the hybrid to the digital, curator as spectator, the mediator, curator as translator of process, the advocate activist, curator as agent, and finally, the idea of event as performance, curator as dramaturg. 
The terms moves is a deliberate one. Rather than strategies or frameworks, there it's termed moves as an intention to explore the emergence of this more responsive, porous, intuitive, and at times even invisible curatorial hand, rather than a preconceived, rigid, or highly authored methodology. One element, however, is certain. Curating is not an activity that can take place in isolation, either from the wider landscape of design practice or from the specifics of institutional, cultural or social politics. The audience is an integral and active part of that equation. So closing the book with the final chapter, Momas Pala Antonelli, the Senior Curator of Architecture and Design, says it's just not relevant to tell people that this is the way it is. I think that the position should be, I have an idea, I think it's interesting, and I'd like to share it and talk about what it might mean. Paula's quote resonates deeply with the intentions of this book. And in many ways, it sums up the project so beautifully. It also marks a really terrific note on which to start tonight's conversation. So Esther, I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you. Fleur, thanks for that overview. I think we've got a pretty, a pretty great sense of the adventures that you are off on, on to. What is the correct term there? Do we go off on adventures? We go on adventures? You're going to have an adventurous time with, with this book. Um, and it's a timely book for the reasons that, that Fleur has just outlined. We need to understand and critique architecture and design for many, many reasons, you know, to advance the disciplines, to expose the power relations inherent in the design decisions that, that shape our lives, that, that frame our public spaces, um, to collapse the neutrality, the supposed neutrality of uh, exhibition and public spaces and unframe our expectations of, 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 of those spatial encounters that architecture wants us to experience to develop a public language, you know, that, that, that is for everyone. Um, and as Flo was just saying, in a field that's constantly changing and complexifying, we need to consider the very active role of curatorial practice, one that is active, generative and expansive. It is fantastic that we have um, so many of um, such a great kind of group um, among those um, uh, featured and presented in Fleur's book. And as you can see, uh, there are some in person, there are some online, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, <laughs> this is Rory waving to Eric and Beatrice. It's great to see them both. I'm going to introduce them. I'm going to have the time, I think, just to ask one question to each and then give Fleur a chance to respond as well. Hopefully give us all a chance to, to ask a question before we head across uh, into the yard uh, and, and, and over to, um, to Bookshop by Uro. So first of all, Eric Chen is General and Artistic Director of Hetnoya Institute, the Dutch National Museum and Institute for Architecture, Design and Digital Culture in Rotterdam. In The New Curator, Arik is in conversation with independent curator Kauko Ota, so please make Arik feel welcome. Kate Goodwin, who is seated right here, is Professor of Practice in Architecture at the University of Sydney and Curatorial Lead at the Tin Sheds Gallery. Formerly, she was Head of Architecture and Heinz Curator at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, where she curated numerous exhibitions, including Sensing Spaces, which features as a case study in The New Curator. Please welcome Kate. Rory Hyde, right here, is Associate Professor in Architecture, Curatorial Design and Practice at the University of Melbourne, uh, loves hearing his own bio, and Design Advocate for the Mayor of London. From 2013 to 2020, he was the Curator of Contemporary Architecture and Urbanism at the v &A Museum, and in The New Curator, Rory is in conversation with architect, curator and educator, Eva Franch Igilabel. Please welcome Rory. 
Beatrice Lanza is a cultural strategist, curator and critic with a background in Asian studies who was based in Beijing for 17 years. She was executive director of MUT, Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology in Lisbon. Craig, director of Beijing Design Week, and co-founded the Global School, the first independent institute for interdisciplinary creative research established in the People's Republic of China. In the new curator, Beatrice is the focus of a conversation with curator, author, and educator Zoe Ryan. Welcome, Beatrice. <laughs> Now, Eric and Beatrice are obviously zooming in from the other side of the world time zone, so we, we will send extra, extra welcome vibes to them. And Susan Kahn is an artist with multiple personalities, jeweler, craftsperson, designer, curator, writer, performer. Living on Wurundjeri land in Nam, Melbourne, she brings a conceptual approach to her work together with a keen interest in contemporary culture and technology. Con is represented by Anna Schwartz Gallery in Nam, Melbourne. Her performance series, Meaninglessness, in collaboration with David Pledger, features as a case study in The New Curator. Welcome, Con. So, so many great questions that I could pose to all of you. Uh, you'll see that a range of images um, from Fleur's book focusing on our guests um, is circling there as we speak. We're going to start with Eric. And Eric, your conversation with Kauko um, draws out so many of the tensions that are characterised um, throughout the book, but that also um, consider and reconsider the role of curator as journalist, as mediator, as researcher, as marketer, as ringleader. You describe your own agenda as unravelling the possibilities of design and architecture. And at one point, Kauko suggests to you that as curator, you yourself become a medium. So reflecting on those various roles and that other more expansive agenda, um, what did she mean by that? What does it mean for a curator to become a medium themselves? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, well, well first of all, thank you, Floor and, and Esther for, uh, for, uh, for having me. Um, yeah, I, I think this goes back to uh, what 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 uh, Fleur was saying, and 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 what the book is about. That the uh, you know the, the field of curation has expanded, um, and therefore the role of the curator uh, has to expand, uh, and it becomes less of a kind of static. Um, uh, it becomes less of a static skill set, right? Like you know, oftentimes uh, uh, these discussions about curation uh, always go back to the kind of et uh, etymological uh, origins of the word, you know, curare, to take care of. You know, um, the, the the notion that curation used to be uh, literally being a caretaker of objects, you know, stored in a museum uh, or other collection, uh, whereas now it's become a lot more. Uh, a, a, a lot more fluid, and in becoming more fluid, uh, in becoming more situational, you know, you are uh, working uh, not in a set situation, but rather multiple situations uh, with, with in di in different contexts, with different needs, with different agendas, with different, uh, let's say, stakeholders. Uh, you need to take a more sort of tactical approach, I guess, and um, and 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 in being a, uh, and in taking this tactical approach. Um, uh, you need to be a bit more of a shapeshifter, uh, or, or, or a bit more shape shapeshifting, let's say. Um, uh, and I guess it's through that shapeshifting that you then uh, become more of a medium, or at least that's how I sort of interpreted uh, uh, Kyoko's role uh, uh, comment. Sorry, it's it's still a bit early for me. <laughs> It is extremely early where Eric is, which makes us extra super duper lucky to have him with us. Um, that that shape shifting, I think, is is really important. That notion of a medium sounds like um, the curator is a a channel, a kind of a um, you know we think of medium often in that supernatural sense as well, which I think is quite uh, electrifying in in considering the newness of the new curator. Um, but I'm also now just connecting that to what you were saying about. Um, the, the building of narratives and that transnational role of the, the curator. There's a, a great moment in your discussion uh, where you talk about building narratives around the transnational migration of ideas, 
objects and people and that those narratives densify the closer you get to where you're situated. Does that give us perhaps a sense of, you know, we've, we've always got, you know, we, we, we want to have that transnational approach. We tend to, for many reasons, have a bias to where we're located and, you know, the pandemic hasn't helped in that, in that regard. Um, but tell us more about, yeah, that, that densifying, but also the need to, to have that transnational sense. Yeah, well, I, I guess, first of all, um, we should clarify that when we say that the, the curator is, is a medium or channel, that, that of course does not imply uh, that that role is, is uh, neutral, uh, right? Just just uh, in the same way that um, the curatorial space that Fleur was describing is, is not a neutral space. So there, um, uh, you, are, you are sort of a channel but, uh, or, or medium, but you do have obviously a lot of um, uh, agency that has to be uh, acknowledged and also your own biases. Uh, and uh in, in many ways the uh we are we are uh a medium but uh you know the medium is the message in some ways right um you know uh, as 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 mediums um you know, we are of course uh um uh coming to that role with usually messages that we want to uh, uh send and and communicate and perhaps have some some sort of influence with now in terms of uh this kind of transnational idea, you know, uh, having sort of worked uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and I, I think uh, in the context of uh, uh, the book, we, we, uh, we were talking about uh, my role as a, a curator at the time at M Plus, which is a new museum that just opened in, in, in Hong Kong, um, and how we were trying to resituate uh, local, global, uh, and regional narratives uh, from different vantage points, depending on um, uh, where the where the material or subjects that we were looking at were uh, were 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 situated. And I think that um, that that's that's really important uh, in also defining the role of, of the curator, because there is a certain level of of uh, empathy uh, that you have to have, right? I mean, when you're working in in, in different places. Um, and curation, uh, you know, at least until recently, was becoming a, a more and more global uh, a practice. Let's let, let's see what happens um, uh, going forward. But uh, you know, to to be able to bring sort of your broader perspective to a place uh, requires also kind of inserting yourself uh, empathetically into that place. Um, as a kind of, let's say, to use an, a, an old anthropological term, as a, as a sort of participant observer, right? So you um, really need to shift your, your your perspective. And for me, that really kind of goes back to um, uh, my background uh, in, in journalism, because uh, you know that kind of empathy, or to be able to see things from different sides and different perspectives, uh, is a skill that you really uh, need to develop, uh, or at least try to develop um, as as a journalist. And that re relates also to this sort of, this sort of shape shifting idea, uh, in that uh, whatever you're working on at the time requires different uh, ways of of, of, of thinking, uh, and also different ways of communicating, whether it's um, kind of re uh, like uh, whether it's sort of adjusting your frame of mind to the topic uh, uh, at hand that you're tackling or um, or sort of adjusting the way you communicate based on the medium that you're using as a journalist uh, and the audience that that medium uh, is, is is geared towards so uh, yeah does that answer your question it does Eric thank you and you also um, call to mind that um, there is um, a lot of uh, preoccupation throughout the book with uh, this notion of curation and truth and seeking truth and finding truth and, um, you know, a notion of post-truth and so on. So uh, thank you so much, Eric. Now I'm asking questions in the sequence in which um, uh, they each appear, uh, these uh, curators and, and cultural producers in the book. And the book, um, as... Um, as Fleur outlined, is a, a really kind of generous array of interviews and, and conversations. So next up, Kate, who curated Sensing Spaces Architecture Reimagined, it is one of those exhibitions that I desperately wish I had seen. Um, I imagine Rory... It was great. Yeah, thanks. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, 
It is, it just, yeah, uh, and, and you will have seen images, we'll try and go, oh, it's that, when the image comes up again. Because um, I'm just intrigued by the, the challenge to create haptic spaces, but also, of course, um, what uh, particularly um, interests me for this context is the role of the curator in, um, in commissioning a new work from architects for exhibition. Um, there's, um, uh, th there's a, in, in, in setting out the case study, Fleur outlines some of the, the paradoxes you deploy, that extraordinary sense of scale. But tell us, how does the commissioning, um, how does the, 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 the curator's role in commissioning new work from architects intervene in the discipline of architecture? Um, thank you. I think it's probably quite a nice segue from some of the stuff that Eric was saying it really a lot of what he said I found quite compelling because it did resonate with I think my role as I saw it as a curator in that um, and I mean the exhibition really was about bringing an audience into focus and a sort of critical engagement with their own experience of architecture and something which I think is quite difficult to talk through representation and so I arrived at a desire to commission because of it was talking about a sort of sensory experience that I didn't that had to be conveyed through experience. And it was quite, I mean, I, I think one was then as a sort of medium and I felt there was a very strong sense of responsibility I held. And I think the old idea of the curator as someone who cares, and it was in the notion of caring for a collection, but in this context, I felt really it was about caring for and with the architects. And with each of them, it was a very different relationship and it was also quite a personal relationship and it engaged a lot of trust because I wasn't sure whether it was going to work. You know, could architecture as space actually communicate the ideas we wanted it to communicate? Could an audience perceive some of these things that were underneath and so visceral about architecture, which almost are beyond articulating? It's those things that we feel and experience within ourselves or collectively in the sense of being together in it. And so it was a real journey, I think, and it was a journey for me too because I'd never commissioned at that scale. And, the, you know, it, it was, you know, it's 2,500 square metres at the Royal Academy of Arts. People are paying £15 to come and see it. It holds the main galleries. I mean, financially for the institution, it had a huge uh, thing. There'd been, never been, uh, there, hadn't, there was a, uh, an exhibition of Foster Rogers Sterling work in 1986 at the Royal Academy um, it's an institution run by architects, so I've got all of the big name architects looking over <laughs> one's shoulder about this. So the pressure in this was really quite extraordinary, and that was a, I think, when I felt a really strong sense of responsibility with these architects. You know, this was, so I worked with people like Francis Carey before he, you know, this is 2014, before pre Serpentine. His English still, you know, he's super quick learner, but a lot of the conversations we had about this project were done with eyes and with a lot of gestures and trying to convey something. And for him, it was a really big exposure. So I felt there was a, such a big thing to carry these people with you along a journey. And with, say, Grafton Architects, it was a year and a half real project of working with them and taking them somewhere in their own practice that they hadn't been. And I think there's an amazing opportunity in exhibitions to do that. Actually, it can be a place that opens up work for them or a way of thinking that is a sort of freedom to do it. Um, and I think there was, you know, there was a lot of empathy, there was a lot of care and trust in doing that and in those relationships. I went, had the opportunity to go to um, Chile and work with Peso von Erikhausen and we sat for four days and from morning to night talked about architecture. I had to understand their process so that when I went back to London and this critique came up, we'd started in the same grounding. And so just building upon something, we had to do a quite radical change, but that actually, because we had such strong groundings of knowledge and understanding, that it really came out. It came out of conversation, and I do believe, I think in the commissioning process, architects should be there at the beginning, um, and they helped shape the brief of the exhibition in a way. And I think, for me, it's a really important thing. Architects often come in after a brief has been developed, and that spatial thinking comes kind of afterwards. And I was trying to resolve ways of working through this idea with spatial thinking. So the architects were part of that spatial thinking, part of the idea developing. So my idea got richer and deeper in conversation with them and their works responded. And I think in that, to me, is a kind of... Yeah, answer your question. 
<laughs> and just what an experience to have that, the, the opportunity, to be afforded the opportunity for that kind of immersion is just amazing. Um, now, there are a couple of seats kind of interspersed if, if uh, you people would like to take a seat because, you know, we're only going to keep talking. It's only going to get more interesting and you are going to want to sit down. So I think there's a bit of wriggling happening if you'd like to come and sit down. Um, and also, I did promise when, when I asked Kate her question that images would appear, but they have kind of paused. And I wonder if I'm meant to do something um, and uh, hopefully uh, Shannon will read my mind and uh, uh, do I just simply, do we just press play again? Mm. I've also placed my glass of water in the uh, most easily spillable location, which was, uh, you know, obviously on purpose. Um, we could also bring Eric and um, be bigger on screen. Yes, Shannon is now going to... Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Yes. We need bigger faces. Everyone can have a look at the book afterwards. Yes. All right, brilliant. We're all comfy and we will, we will have images. But, I mean, it's um, one of the many reasons to get your hands on a copy of this book is to, is to read that case study and, and, and see um, uh, what we've all missed in, in experiencing that show. Um, so thank you, Kate. And a question for Rory, who appears next in the book. Rory, you note um, in your conversation that the practice of curation is, is, is quite uh, under-theorised, um, which is perhaps, you know, the, the, the old curator, if, 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 if we want to make that dichotomy. I'm now just starting to pick up on our, you know, if we have a new curator, who's, who's the old curator? Really quite enjoying this. Um, so the old curator as, um, you know, perhaps hidden, invisible, inert, this, you know, notion where, you know, very much collapsing and moving on from now that, that the museum is, it, it, is somehow a, um, um, you know, an, an, an independent kind of, um, um, you know, uh, authentic apolitical space. So um, let's talk about your many roles because um, your new curator has been an explicitly politically charged role at times, particularly in, for example, um, advising a mayor and in the conversation that you have uh, with uh, Eva, she also created work, which is to, you know, offer challenges and provocations for a mayor. And there's also a conversation there about when thinking about the civic, the political, the public, to avoid a dumbing down of um, some of the key questions and provocations and we're aiming for, um, you know, a, a broad audience is talking to... Um, um, Eva about uh, her time at Storefront. So my question very broadly is how does the new curator uh, nurture new publics? Thanks, Esther. Um, You've got lots I, of notes. Yeah, <laughs> I do, I do, I do. I like lots of notes. Look, I think, um, you know, a lot of the work that I did and certainly I can see the work you know, similar resonances in Kate's work, in Eric's work, in, um, in, in, um, uh, it, it, that we're all trying to stretch the definition of what we do. We're trying to stretch the agency of our institutions. We're trying to stretch toward people who we want to reach. And I think that, you know, Eva's work on, at the storefront is really important because it's, sorry, am I, is that better? Yeah. Right in there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, they're right on the street. And, yeah, yeah. and she talks about needing to appeal both to the architects, the, in, the you know, in-house um, people, but also to the person driving past in a van. Mm. You know, so how can you operate in a space like that on both um, levels? Mm. And in a similar way, I think perhaps we try to do that at the v &A. You know, we try to acknowledge, yes, okay, we've got these members or the people who come to our events and the sort of V&A type people, but can we, you know, that's the, the show we did called All of This Belongs to You was really about saying, well, actually, it belongs to everybody. How do we redefine who our audience is? How do we stretch that as far as possible? So working with um, artists, architects like Liza Fee or Muff, they um, quite purposefully push this idea as far as possible. So they brought in a refugee agency into the gallery, um, set that up there for six months, hosted language lessons, um, gave advice for finding housing, 
um, and tours, of course, of the art of the galleries. But you know, the curators, the the old curators, let's call them, freaked out. Like this was, <laughs> in, you know, they ha had a full blown panic attack because. What are these people doing in the gallery? They refuse to give a tour at one point. They won't understand. They don't speak English properly. Well, you're going to do the fucking tour. <laughs> and so, you know, ultimately we realised that, you know, Liza's project and, and hopefully I think what our project was about that institutional change, about reorganising, reorienting towards a different public um, and to say that actually, you know, there's, we, we can't just play to the gallery anymore. Um, and so somebody like Bob and Roberta Smith, who, was, um, who launched uh, their um, political campaign in the gallery, you know, um, audiences should look like taxpayers, was part of his um, campaign platform. And, you know, that for us as a sort of elite institution is quite a challenge to meet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I'm not sure, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest that we did it, but everything we did was trying to do that. Yeah. And that's where the political comes in and that's where you try to get outside of design and into the world or something. Yeah. I like this notion of, um, you know, we, 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 we're going to glamorise the taxpayer. It's perfect. It's what we all need to do. And, uh, and, and the voter, this being a, an auspicious year in, 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 in that regard. But I think that's, um, I think that's a really important um, observation. But also, yes, thank you for sharing those <laughs> insights into uh, what managed to scare people into engaging with, you know, the actual public. Goodness me. Oh, I know everyone's going to have some questions about that. I'm going to ask a couple more, one to Beatrice, one to Con, and um, we're going to have some reflections from Fleur, but please have your questions ready as well. So, Beatrice, hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, there are... Hello. There are so many great insights um, in your discussion with Zoe about the new curator's globalised practice against that kind of, um, that sort of cultural and curatorial awkwardness of, of negotiating the global in a very local context. You know, we've had a bit of discussion so far already about how uh, the pandemic has halted some of our global collaborations, but in other ways it has exploded them um, in, in, in the way that we um, now more happily engage with technology. Uh, QED, here we all are. Um, but you speak of the changing skill set um, of the curator in among all of these changes and tensions. So what would be your advice? How can we best prepare the new curators of the future to, as you put it, live instead by trespassing borders, whether they are public, corporate or academic? How do we prepare those future new curators to transgress uh, those, uh, those uh, to, to trespass and to transgress those boundaries. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. And I want to say that it's even earlier here where I am than when Ari is. <laughs> you know, like, you so win. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> well, um, good question. I don't know about advices, but, you know, I can only speak from experience, right? Um, I think that what me and, and Zoe were talking about in that sense was that we both um, came from um, experiences where curatorial practice really wasn't simply about, um, you know, creating sort of uh, narratives uh, through um, the exhibition, you know, like of, of, of objects, of projects and etc. But um, really one in which um, curators become uh, sort of somehow guardians or, or caretakers uh, of, of an entire process, you know, like of, of um, from ideation to implementation, you know, of an idea. And often that idea, of course, involves the contribution, participation of the community of others. Uh, of other people, entities, and etc. But mostly, um, uh, the necess you know the need for uh, really being able to uh, create a, a context for for new ideas and 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 propositions, you know, like to be 
to be born or to be tested and presented. Uh, many of the projects that we mentioned in that conversation, of course, are uh, were well, still related at that time. Um, I was still in Beijing. Uh, you know, I had, uh, you know, um, uh, finished my experience with Beijing Design Week and I was running the global school, which was all predicated on this idea that um, we wa we wanted to somehow uh, use the city or or use the you know like the social context of the city the the actual you know economic and geopolitical if you want factors you know like that were uh, embedded in the city as uh, a springboard for curatorial practice and this often meant. Um, also being capable of negotiating, uh, you know, conditions for, for projects to happen. So what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, ideation of a project is a very important part, uh, of course, of a uh, of a, a, a thinking practice, which is uh, what, what, what curatorial practice is. Uh, but carrying that, you know, throughout means a whole set of other, let's say, uh, you know, um, innovations often and, and uh, uh, you know, like thinking out of the box, you know, like type of, the type of you know, um, requires kind of, uh, you know, out of the box thinking, you know, like in skill sets uh, to bring that project to completion. So uh, there is a more definitely, let's call it perhaps a form of uh, um, enlightened pragmatism, uh, you know, that needs to come involved i think in in being a curator whatever that you know um uh word means uh you know like by now b thank you, know, you. that was clear enough <laughs> you know <laughs> oh we're, we're extra lucky that uh, b and eric were happy to be early risers um um, v, continuing that thought, but um, thinking about what you also note um, in the book about uh, uh, biennialism, triennialism, festivalism, the perennial event, um, that seems, I guess, to um, uh, jar, I guess, um, with um, that more kind of um, open, expansive notion that, that we've been discussing when there is that pressure to be... Um, you know, kind of um, uniquely exceptionalist, I guess. Um, tell us about your, your thoughts there in um, um, giving the new curator that, that, that context around the proliferation of uh, biennales, triennales and so on. How does that affect practice? Um, well, I, uh, I think in that specific case, we ended up talking about that phenomenon also because of course Zoe you know curated you know what like the, the Istanbul design biennale you know and in you know the, the point was like what's the difference between being a curator in an institution you know like from that of being exactly more of a sort of uh, maker you know like as as uh, you know um, Harold Zima wanted it in the beginning uh, but well, I, I have to say that I believe more and more that curatorial practice is really uh, based on sort of it's a situational practice. So it's really about knowing how to read into a context through a context and the players and stakeholders involved in that context, uh, you know, like, and therefore generate blueprints of, of you know, um, uh, of discussion, of, of, of reflection and et cetera, for whatever the object of curatorial practice is, be it an exhibition, a, a, a public program, uh, you know, like a, a sort of, um, you know, uh, a series of, you know, like interventions uh, or, or, or whatever the case. So um, I think it's also important in general that one understands curatorial practice as a uh, one that embeds different forms of duration. So curatorial practice, and it, so so there you we come to that sense of festivalism, you know, like that we were discussing with Zoe, uh, is that also there is a certain intensity I find into creating the situation, you know, and what a curator does, and often it requires the capacity to act uh, timely and 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 punctually and specifically. Um, so I think it's more, uh, in my experience, it's also been what, what I was doing running uh, MAT, the, you know, like in, uh, in, uh, here in Lisbon, um, that there is a lot to it, which is um, different ways of dealing with publics, you know, like in context uh, where curatorial practice have, you know, 
a different durational, you know, can, can have a different durational expanse. And the intensity of that festivalism is one example, I think, in which, you know, curators sort of like um, are formed. B, thank you, and, and, and thank you for highlighting um, duration as an element. We've talked about the spatial, of course, we've talked about the haptic, um, and that sense of offering um, um, an artist, a designer, an architect, but also an audience member time, um, and the duration of experience, I think, is yeah, absolutely essential to, to the practice. Um, so thank you, B. and a question now for Con. Con, I've long been in love with your brain, you know that. Um, and so I was delighted to see, um, I was quite galvanised when you and Pledger um, were first working on Meaninglessness because, you know, what an extraordinary uh, project um, given the ugliness of the Danish government's decision, um, as you may have um, heard to, uh, some years ago. And I think still now... It's still. still it's still. Now, it's actually come into play again because of the Ukraine. Ukraine situ situation. Yeah. I'm not sure if everyone's aware um, when people seeking asylum enter um, the Danish um, uh, borders, the nation, they um, uh, reserve the right to confiscate uh, jewellery which they determine to be. It was any assets over the equivalent of 2000 Australian dollars, yeah. yeah. including jewellery. So it's called the jewellery legislation. And there was outcry about it and they said, oh, you can keep your wedding rings. And then there was further outcry and this, po this government person, politician, said, OK, you can keep your engagement rings but we will take anything, any meaningless jewellery and there's no such thing. And it was to be confiscated to, be, um, to subsidise the upkeep of the... And it's still in place despite changes of government. Yeah, it is just abhorrent. And in the um, in, in considering the case study and in, and in the, uh, the in, in in the work, um, you pose the very powerful question: How can we as citizens behave proactively when our government's values are hostile to our own? Um, I mean, that's 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 a really powerful question. But it can also be a very disempowering question because involves the reflection that our government's values might be hostile to our own. You know, to make that realisation can be disempowering, can also be empowering. So my massive question for you, Con, is how do curatorial frameworks reignite us into considering the meaning that we make in our own lives? Hmm. I have to declare right at the outset that I'm the great pretender here. I'm not a curator, listening to all for the other speakers that I work from. I'm an artist. I work from a different position. So the thinking, the curator's thinking, was not part of this project or necessarily part about how I work. So, um, hmm, how do I answer that? Perhaps it's a question of um, when uh, curators have engaged with you, when you have presented your work um, um, in a uh, in a way in which you're you're offering a framework, you're, you're collaborating with with another. Um, the um, meaninglessness was an exhibition, but it was also some workshops. It was a, a very kind of active. It was a performance. It wasn't an exhibition. Yes. Um, so it was a performance that was taken on the road. Um, it did start out as an exhibition. I had gone over to Denmark to try and find out how the government was converting the jewellery to income. I knew they wouldn't be selling it on eBay. And um, I wanted to find out how they were selling it and to, to buy jewellery and find the rightful owner and return it. And that was the project and find out whether the government then reconfiscated it so it was, um, and the most wonderful thing happened in that process. I discovered that none of the jewellery had been taken because the border guards in Denmark refused to confiscate it. They quietly took a stand. They still searched people. They'd searched them by panning outside moon. They said, we, who are we to judge? 
that, and that's something that returned my faith in humanity. Um, so out of that, I was con um, talked into doing a performance, a conversation, talking about Australian history um, with refugees, and um, I certainly wasn't there to criticise Denmark because we're much worse here. We don't let them land with or without their jewellery. Um, so it was not curatorial practice as such. So I do feel like the pretender here, I must admit, the interloper. Um, I feel like the pretender with you here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all in having a bit of a we are not worthy moment <laughs> at the moment. Um, tell us, Con, um, about um, either through that project or, or another then, um, that sense of your engagement with curators because you're someone who... Uh, of the various um, performances that I've had the pleasure of experiencing. When you're in a space, uh, you reframe a space. You create quite a spatial encounter as well as a shift in, in meaning, in, 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 um, in, in that thinking process, in that revaluating process. What's it been like for you working with curators in various spaces? Oh, um depends on the circumstance, of course. <laughs> depends on. What was interesting, going back to meaninglessness for a minute and talking about um, some of the things that have come up, one of the most valuable things about the performance, there's a, a section in it where I do ask the audience to bring their own stories and how that opens up a thinking about an idea and about work and how an audience will then curate a conversation. I think that was something I hadn't expected and was very enlightening for me. Um, so I think it can happen that other way as well. It's not something that's planned. It just grows from the circumstance. That is an excellent segue to the questions I'm sure you must have, and we have got time for one or two, and then uh, we'll ask um, Fleur uh, to respond. Was that a thumbs up, that we have got time for one or two? Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Who would like to start with a question for any of our speakers, including Eric and B, um, who were right there? There is so much to, to ask in everything that we've discussed so far. Or shall I reflect first and get everyone time to think of a question? Please. And likely I will then, when you ask your question, I will then repeat it for the recording. The question was, there was conversation about curators and institutions. And those two things are at two parts of the scale. You need to curate the institution. But there was a few, in my mind, a few conversations about the public, the audience, the people in the middle. The question for the panel is, who is the public? What is the publicness between the curator and the institution? Does the public, first of all, care? Who are they? So between the two points of the spectrum, what is the public? So there's a lovely, massive question for the end of the evening. Who is the public when we're thinking about um, the curator's role within the institution? We're thinking about the institution as well. Um, who would like to tackle that one? We kind of we touched on that a little bit in talking to Rory, but I think we've all touched on it in different ways. Who is the public? I mean, I'm happy to start, but then I think actually it'd be great to hear from Rory too around your festival that's coming up oh, yeah. and, and everybody else. Um, I mean, I think one of the things is that all of the uh, curators here, and I use that in an expansive term, I think it's really important uh, when we're talking today that we don't get caught in this binary. First of all, between old curators and new curators, that's a, a, a kind of, um, and I think we, we heard B particularly, or Beatrice, and and Eric really talk resonantly to that expanded practice. And I think that goes to the public too. I think we are really looking at, um, Beatrice also talked about this idea of the durational, using the city as a gallery. I think we heard from Kate uh, about, and Rory actually with the V&A, this really important uh, element of risk. And what I would say is that uh, what I see around all these practitioners is that they're willing to take risks with the public. And it goes back to 
what Antonella, uh, sorry, Paola Antonelli was saying, um, that, you know, we're, we're here not to say this is the way it is, public. Um, this is what you need to know. We're saying there's something interesting in these conditions or challenging in these conditions and we're trying to figure it out in a contemporary context and we think that perhaps these are the relevant salient points to consider or this is the time to step up, um, this is the time to be an activist, um, but actually we need to do it together and we need to question ourselves all the way through. So I think when we talk about public, we're not talking about that traditional sense of people coming and buying a ticket to a museum or a gallery. Sometimes we are, as Rory and Kate spoke really resonantly to. But sometimes we're actually saying, what, how can we use the city? Or let's not just talk about the city either, the suburbs and the regions, to think about what are the most critical questions for us and, and what can a curatorial project, let's forget about an exhibition for a moment, but what can a curatorial project do that a book can't? an interview on, a te on television can't, um, that other forms can't, what is its agency in that space um, to communicate with as an exchange rather than uh, telling what it is. Thank you, Fleur. Uh, Eric or B, would you like to address that question about the public? Eric. Yeah, well, um, maybe, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not normally one for uh, the semantic splitting of hairs, but, but I think we should um, uh, really move away from talking about the public uh, and really um, instead think about publics, uh, plural, because the, the public, of course, is not a, a, a monolith, um, excuse me, a monolithic thing. My tongue is not cooperating uh, this morning, um, but rather... Uh, you know, there are uh, different voices, perspectives, needs, uh, desires, interests uh, within the public. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and when we also talk about, uh, you know, the, the old sort of quote unquote diversity and, and, and inclusion <clears throat> that we all should be not just talking about, but also acting upon, uh, uh, talking about publics in the plural sense is a really uh, uh, important step to really uh, embedding the acknowledgement that we are talking to different people uh, in different ways simultaneously. And in some ways, that requires a more multifaceted uh, a, a approach. There, <clears throat> there is no sort of rule book for this. Um, and there's uh, the, um, uh, but, it, but, but, but it needs a sort of, um, uh, in some ways, it's a bit intuitive, but, but, but intuition not as a form of magic, but, but as a form of gained experience. Um, and gaining that experience requires going out there and talking to different publics and sort of really understanding um, uh, who, it, who it is that you're talking to. And then again, finding different ways of uh, not just uh, communicating uh, to them, but engaging with them. Eric, thank you. You've made me reflect um, in various contexts in which I work, whether they're artistic, governance, political, um, I often define the public as everyone who's not in this room right now. And then the question is, why couldn't they get into this room right now? And then you start to think about what, what, what publics mean. Have we got one more question for anyone in the panel? So many things to ask. Jana, go ahead and I will paraphrase for the recording. Oh. And sort of what you see as sort of the rewards of doing that. 
That is a great question. So for um, B and Eric's benefit, the question is about um, travelling or touring exhibitions, uh, loans, um, and what happens when... Um, uh, what, what are the kinds of strategies, the tactics um, that are deployed to uh, bring um, those objects, that, that, that collection, into new uh, dialogues in their different context? Who would like to approach that one? I'm looking for waves from B or from Eric or other signs from us here. Looks like Rory's about to say something. No. I can set the context and then maybe Eric or Beatrice or anyone would like to jump in. I think, Jana, um, thank you for that question. And I know exactly uh, the project you're talking about. You're talking about the future is here from, from the Design Museum. And um, this idea of the prosthetic, which was um, definitely about this idea of taking what might be a traditional touring show model... Um, and in some ways subverting it. So in this context, it was an ability to um, create connections internationally, which uh, at the time was quite useful, um, but actually critique it at the same time. Uh, and in doing that, it was, it was kind of partly necessary because we were working within very constrained environments, very constrained timeframes, and I think this goes back to this idea of risk and this is what I see in all of the people who have come around this book and UConn because I don't think it is about um, someone not being a curator or, or being a curator. I mean, what was so amazing about your project um, with meaninglessness was that it came into the book at the very last minute almost, almost like a ability to kind of be responsive to that condition and that was so wonderful. Um, you also were part of The Future Is Here and what was really important about that opportunity was to say, OK, here is uh, an opportunity to talk about, in that case, we were talking about the idea of a third wave industrial revolution, the idea of new technologies on the high street, but actually bring it into our own context at that point, which was a kind of design research context, and saying, OK, well, let's just forget about the high street at the moment. That's something that's happening in the design museum context. What about if we shift it to speculation and experimentation and actually take some of these projects that are live now happening at that point in time that we really don't know where they're going? So a really good example of that was Roland Snooks, who is in the design fair at the moment and is now producing quite um, refined works. And in that case, uh, we commissioned him to essentially do a live experiment and produce his first um, kind of test at a one-to-one -one scale along with a whole number of other practitioners that for time I won't go into. One of the things that we did really ask ourselves though was what if it fails? And I think that's really hard often for cultural produ producers to consider. What happens if we don't pull it off and we're taking this risk and we're going to make an experiment? How might you curate or consider those conditions? What might you do to tell the story that is more important than the end object, potentially? And that was something, um, again, with my colleagues, we thought long and hard about. It was very challenging for the Design Museum. Rory, we had a few of those kind of really sticky conversations that you were talking about earlier. Um, but actually, it was much more rewarding because it was grounded in the context of Melbourne, what was happening here, and the different creative practitioners that were coming around those kind of ideas that were really nascent at the time. Fleur, thank you, and thank you, Yana, for the question. We are just about, in fact, we are out of time. We're not just about out of time. So we will save Fleur's reflections Esther, on, on practice. I'd like to make a proposition. I'd, quite, I'd be interested in teleporting as a curation because you don't know what's going to come out the other end. Mm. That is an excellent provocation to end on. I think um, mm, I like the idea of just being scrambled into nothingness and then being hopefully re-scrambled. And then who knows? Who knows what, what might happen? I like that. Thanks, Con. Now, I'm going to make some thanks uh, and then encourage us uh, to head across to Uro. 
um, to get your hands on a copy of the book. But first of all, uh, big thanks to Bookshop by Uro and to Monica and to Shannon uh, for producing tonight. Uh, big, big thank you, thank you. Um, Another brilliant book design by Stuart Geddes, uh, who is not here, but he almost needs to be uh, credited as taking, you know, a sort of an exhibition or curatorial design kind of, you know, credit here. It's quite a contribution to the book. Uh, to Arik Chen and to Beatrice Lianza for joining us from the far away time zones. Thank you so, so much. To Rory, to Kate and to Con, thank you so, so much. And of course, to the extraordinary Fleur Watson, uh, massive congratulations on the book. Um, I think it makes for timely reading. I think it's going to give us an expansive sense of our own practice, no matter where we are in that kind of creative, curatorial critical space. Um, so big thank you and congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. And now very importantly, you have purchased a ticket to be here tonight, so good for you. That ticket price is redeemable against the purchase of a book. How fantastic. So head across to Uro and buy yourself a book uh, and um, Hopefully, Flo will even sign it for you. The recording of tonight's conversation um, will be available soon. Um, and there'll be the great bit where Rory sort of walks off set while we're sort of still <laughs> thanking people. That's going to be my personal highlight. Uh, so thank you all very, very much and have a great evening. And thank you to you, Esther. <laughs>